All right, Carl, we good? I look okay? Shut up. I mean, do I look normal? All right, nice. Okay. No, I know I'm not wearing any socks or shoes. Yes, I know I'm wearing red shorts. It's fine. It's a torso shot. No one's ever going to know. It's our little secret. It's like the pandemic days, remember? Zoom meetings and interviews. It's all business up top and Lord knows what on the bottom. No one cares. No one's going to know. Wait, why is the record light on? Carl! Welcome to this video lecture. Today we're going to discuss bioethics. In previous lectures, I suggested that there are three primary subdisciplines in ethics. Metaethics, which explores foundational questions about morality. Normative ethics, which seeks to provide overarching theories that tell people how they should act or what kind of people they should be. And applied ethics, which addresses real world moral issues. Shut up, Carl. My shorts are not a real world moral issue. While I think it's helpful to note that these branches of ethics are distinct, I think it's also important to note that they overlap and rely on one another in many cases. Like most categories, Categories, they're a bit blurry around the edges. Let me explain. Bioethics is an example of applied ethics because it addresses real-world moral issues in the practice of medicine, research, public health, and so on. However, bioethics often requires some meta-ethical considerations. As one example, bioethics often has to struggle with the question of cultural subjectivism. Think of it this way. If morality is absolute, then there are right and wrong answers about euthanasia, abortion, and access to healthcare. But if morality is subjective to individuals and cultures, then how one approaches these questions is going to look very different. Also, how someone approaches the practice of medicine or the development of law is going to look different. Bioethics also often relies on normative ethical theory as well. Consider an issue like abortion. Some people argue that abortion is never morally permissible because it's an intrinsically evil act. They have a staunch deontological view that we have an obligation to avoid abortion at all times in all cases, regardless of the consequences. Others think that abortion is morally permissible if the good that comes from that action outweighs, or at least is equal, to the harm that the action causes. For instance, if the life of the mother is saved in the process of an abortion. This is a consequentialist argument. Of course, these aren't the only views on abortion, but they demonstrate that normative theory is often part of bioethical discussions. It's also important to emphasize that bioethics is multidisciplinary. It draws on philosophy, law, biology, and many other disciplines. As one example, if we want to address questions concerning the end of human life, we'll need to establish a definition of death. The question, when is someone dead, might seem fairly straightforward at first, but it's worth noting that the definition of death has shifted over the years with developing technology. For example, changing from a focus on respiration to a focus on brain activity. Today, to answer the question, when is someone dead, requires at bare minimum an exploration of both philosophy and biology, as well as a healthy dose of neuroscience. Then, once we've attempted to establish a definition of death, we have to figure out how to take that definition and translate it into applicable laws. It's actually not an easy task. The point here is that bioethics, as an example of applied ethics, often draws upon both meta-ethics and normative ethics, and requires insights from many different disciplines. The John Hopkins Berman Institute of bioethics provides a helpful insight here. Bioethical questions often involve overlapping concerns from diverse fields of study, including life sciences, biotechnology, public health, medicine, public policy, law, philosophy, and theology. They arise in clinical, research, and political arenas, usually in response to advances in biology, healthcare, and technology, particularly biotechnology. In terms of distilling these claims down to a simple definition, well, that can be a little bit tricky. Not even all bioethicists agree on a definition of bioethics. I know. Surprise, surprise. One primary question concerns the boundaries of bioethics, particularly as these boundaries relate to, and extend beyond, questions of medical ethics. A little secret though, sometimes people use the terms bioethics, medical ethics, and biomedical ethics interchangeably, and sometimes they use them to mean different things. So be careful out there. We can explore the boundaries of bioethics by asking the question, what actually counts as a bioethical issue? Consider the following questions. Should gene editing technology be used to develop children who are resistant to certain diseases? Should the same technology be used to develop children who have other culturally desirable traits that have nothing to do with health? Should a nurse or doctor ever lie to a patient if doing so is conducive to the patient's overall well-being? How should we allocate scarce resources such 
such as livers. Should factors like age and addiction matter? Under what conditions is it acceptable to perform experiments on human beings? Under what conditions is it acceptable to perform experiments on non-human animals? If animals are used in experiments, what moral obligations do humans have toward them while keeping them in captivity? Is it morally permissible to violate the rights of individuals for the safety of a community by practices such as forced quarantine or isolation? When is it morally permissible for a woman to pursue an abortion? Under what conditions is it acceptable for someone to choose to die? And is it acceptable for that person to take drugs to hasten their death? And is it morally acceptable for someone else, say a trained physician, to administer those drugs to hasten their death? Is healthcare a human right? Which healthcare system is the most moral or most just? How do factors such as race, sex, and ethnicity affect the practice of medicine in terms of bias? Are there moral limits to the practice of cloning? And if so, what are they? Should reproductive rights include the right to surrogacy, including making a child with three parents? Should doctors have a right not to perform medical procedures that are against their conscience? Should vaccines be mandatory, or at least have penalties attached if people refuse to take them? Should the government have the ability to regulate companies in terms of pollution for the sake of public health? If you think, as I tend to, that all of these questions fall under the discipline of bioethics, then you have a fairly broad definition of the term. It extends well beyond humans to include non-human animals and the environment. It also extends beyond the practice of medicine to include issues regarding living and dying, the relationship between healthcare professionals and patients, the moral standing of humans at all stages of life, the moral standing of non-human creatures, legal questions regarding rights and responsibilities in the public sphere, the development and use of technology to address disease, disability, and reproductive rights, questions regarding the promotion of justice in healthcare, especially in terms of race, sex, and ethnicity, and issues in clinical research. One more thing is worth noting in this introduction to bioethics. One particular approach to bioethics has been fairly dominant since the 1970s. It's called principalism. The basic idea of principalism is that there are foundational prima facie principles that provide a starting point for us when it comes to addressing bioethical issues. Prima facie is a Latin expression that, when used in law, philosophy, or ethics, means at first sight. From a moral standpoint, it refers to the idea that there are principles that, at first sight, we are obliged to follow. However, these principles might conflict with other prima facie principles. So, while we're obligated to follow them at first sight, when we look at the larger context or the situation, we might discover that there are other principles that carry more weight. The most common version of principalism was developed in the late 1970s by the American philosophers Tom Beecham and James Childress in their work Principles of Biomedical Ethics. As an aside, while Beecham and Childress use the term biomedical ethics, they note that they take that term to be synonymous with a broad understanding of bioethics. Beecham and Childress argue that there is a common morality that all cultures basically accept. Part of this common morality includes four principles that apply to bioethics. Respect for autonomy, or the duty to respect the free decisions and preferences of others. Beneficence, or the duty to seek the well-being of others. Non-maleficence, or the duty to avoid causing harm to others. And justice, or the duty to seek fair processes for all morally significant entities. These principles are purposefully vague. For instance, instance, it's unclear what good means or well-being looks like. It's also unclear what constitutes a harm. But that's part of Beecham and Childress's point. All cultures accept these vague principles, but they specify the principles differently. And so these four principles require specification. And here we're going to run into disagreement and debate. What does it mean to seek the well-being of someone? What does it mean to avoid harming them? What does justice look like? And so on. Furthermore, when the principles conflict, they require close evaluation in those unique circumstances to determine which principle actually carries the most weight. In other words, which principle is our actual obligation. Now, in some cases, this is fairly simple. For instance, imagine a child somehow ingested a poison. There's an antidote, but it has to be administered by way of a needle. Here, we have two conflicting principles. On the one hand, we have beneficence. We want to seek the well-being of the child. That seems to mean administering the antidote to save the child's life. On the other hand, we have non-maleficence. Puncturing the child with a needle is causing a harm. At first sight, you wouldn't walk around just stabbing kids with needles. Carl, please agree with me. Okay, thank you. Sheesh. I was worried about that one. So here, beneficence and non-maleficence are in tension with one another. 
we can't do both. But few people would struggle with this case. Almost everybody would administer the antidote to the child, thereby saving the child's life. That suggests that in this case, we consider the harm caused to be so minimal and the good achieved to be so great that the prima facie obligation of non-maleficence is outweighed by the prima facie obligation of beneficence. But that's a fairly simple case. What if we explore a more complex case? What if instead of ingesting poison, the child has cancer? And what if, instead of an antidote administered through a needle, the child has to go a very painful cancer treatment therapy? And what if, instead of a guarantee that the antidote will work, there's only a 25% chance that this painful therapy will meaningfully extend the child's life? And let's make it worse. Because you know, that's what we do. After learning all of this information, the child shares with you, let's imagine you're the parent in this case, that they don't want the extremely painful treatment. Now we have the principle of beneficence, which might suggest that a 25% chance at a meaningfully longer life is a good worth pursuing. Suing. But we also have the principle of non-maleficence, which might suggest that an extremely painful treatment with only a 25% chance of success should be avoided because of the intense harm that it will cause. Finally, we have the principle of autonomy, which raises the philosophical question, leaving aside for a moment the legal question of how autonomous a child is and how much weight their decision should carry. As this case shows, the principles can conflict in very complicated ways, and specifying and weighing the principles can be extremely difficult. In the coming weeks, we'll explore some bioethical issues, drawing on metaethics, normative ethics, and the approach of principalism where applicable. In the meantime, I hope you found this introductory video helpful. I think the shorts are fine. I mean, yeah, they're red, but no one's, I'm seriously, no one's going to see it's fine. Otherwise, I'd be really hot in here. That song about, like, you know, sweat and all that stuff. Carl! <laughs>